Hello, church. As you may know, Cindy and I are on vacation here at our island home of Nantucket, Massachusetts, until next Friday, September 18th, when we will return home to Phoenix. I continue to remain in contact with our church leadership team during this time of respite and want to update you on an important development in our ongoing conversation with Phoenix Theatre Company about their desired use of our Courtyard campus for its upcoming season. We first informed you about this initiative in an August 12th e-blast of our Church Council's August 10th actions. In keeping with my promise of total transparency of all workings of our Council, please take some time to review a proposal we have received from Phoenix Theatre Company. This proposal in toto will be attached to our e-blast this Sunday, September 6th, Wednesday, September 9th, and Sunday, September 13th for your consideration. Also, please note that a subcommittee consisting of Becky Fisher, Patrick Daly, Steve Hildebrand, Susan Madison, and I have preliminarily reviewed this proposal and have discussed it with James Huntwork, a Central Church member and attorney proficient in lease agreements. Of course, we have concerns about some of the details of that proposal, including but not limited to their serving of alcohol on our campus. As acknowledged in our social principles, we affirm our long-standing support of abstinence from alcohol as a faithful witness to God's liberating and redeeming love for persons. Yet we will not dare to speak on behalf of our Central Church congregation without your input. Please take some time to review the entirety of this proposal and make your comments known either in an email to the church at cumc.office at centralumc.com or to me or to any church council member. Please know we are committed to listening to your concerns, comments, and suggestions and transmitting them to the entire leadership team for consideration and possible action. Thank you for your time and commitment in helping us rise together in mission and ministry within our Phoenix community and beyond.
Good morning. I'm Steve Hildebrand, Director of Contemporary Worship here at Central Church, a United Methodist community. We're honored that you've chosen to worship with us this morning in our virtual online worship experience. Pastor Paul is still enjoying some time away, but he'll be back with us next week. Once again, we are blessed to have Franklin Evans bring us the morning message, and just a little later on in the service, Kathleen Roden will be singing. Once we resume in-person worship services, we invite you to join us here on the Central Church campus at 1875 North Central Avenue in the heart of the Arts District in Midtown Phoenix. Our Sunday morning liturgical chapel service is held at 9 o'clock, and our Jesus Java and Jazz non-traditional worship experience is at 1015. Until then, we welcome you now to join us in our blended worship experience as we join our voices to prepare for worship. Join with me in our opening prayer this morning. Gracious and most merciful God, we thank you for everyone tuning into our service this day. We ask that you open our minds for that which you have for us this day. 
you truly know our hearts and what we need as we worship together. We come with distractions that prevent us from being fully present. So grant us grace that we may lay those concerns at your feet as we begin worship for the keeping until the service is complete. Bless this time together and bless each person tuned in this day. May we indeed be the body of Christ working together. Amen. Let us welcome to worship our guest artist today, Kathleen Roden, who is singing Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. This morning's gospel lesson is from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Should I forgive as many as seven times? Jesus said, not just seven times, but rather as many as 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, they brought to him a servant who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Because the servant didn't have enough to pay it back, the master ordered that he should be sold along with his wife and children and everything he had and that the proceeds should be used as payment. But the servant fell down kneeled before him and said, please be patient with me and I'll pay you back. 
the master had compassion on that servant, released him, and forgave the loan. When that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 coins. He grabbed him around the throat and said, pay me back what you owe me. Then his fellow servant fell down and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he threw him into prison until he paid back his debt. When his fellow servants saw what happened, they were deeply offended. They came and told their master all that happened. His master called the first servant and said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you appealed to me. Shouldn't you also have mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? His master was furious and handed him over to the guard responsible for punishing prisoners until he had paid the whole debt. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if you don't forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May the peace of Christ dwell where the word of God is spoken. Thanks be to God. When you follow the common lectionary, oftentimes you end up uh, t preaching on subjects and sometimes things that you don't always want to. But also at times it brings a series of conversations together in our messages that work well together, as it has in these last three weeks together. First, we had the burning bush and we see God calling those who don't feel adequate into service and promising that God will be with them as they journey on the path that he has chosen for them. And then last week, we, we had a, a message about coming together and waking up and learning how to be in community in a new way. And then today, we have the opportunity for a fresh and clean start. But oftentimes, as we begin to to prepare ourselves, uh, often, in sermons we often find ourselves preaching about things that we own ourselves need to hear. And this week was none different. And there was some work I had to do in my own life before I could bring this message to you this day. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and most merciful God, open our hearts and our minds to hear what you have for us this day. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our souls together be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. There's a story that comes out of Sumner, New Mexico, which describes the power of revenge. You see, Luciano Mayer, an 81-year-old, had caught a mouse inside of his house and wanted to get rid of it. He was burning some leaves out in his backyard, so he carried the mouse out and threw it into the fire. According to the fire chief, Juan Chavez, the burning mouse ran back into the house and set the dry brush around the house on fire. The flames spread quickly and burned the house down. The inhabitants escaped unharmed, but the house didn't fare so well. The fire chief replied, I've seen a lot of house fires, but never one by a malicious mouse. Oh, the power of revenge. I am sure we have all had our own stories that include desires of revenge. Which brings us to today's gospel reading, which includes P P Peter's famous question. We often wish P Peter had not asked. In the middle of the discussion on relationships in the church and bringing back a sense of community, Peter comes to Jesus and says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or my sister who sins against me? Up to seven times, Peter says. Now, Peter was thinking he was pretty smart because the Old Testament 
laws said that you would forgive three times, you know, that concept of three strikes and you're out. And he was a little taken back by the answer Jesus gave him. I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. And then Jesus goes on to continue with the story of a servant, of a king who owed a massive amount of debt. And the king showed compassion and grace to the servant when the servant told him his story. Yet that same servant could not share that same kindness and compassion with one who owed him money. Now, I can sum up this parable in one sentence. If you're going to follow Jesus, then you must be willing to forgive like Jesus. In this story, we see both forgiveness and grace at work. The servant is given the chance to start over, a fresh start without the heavy burden of debt. Yet, he was not able to see himself to provide that same sense of forgiveness and grace to another which he, which owed him a large debt. He did not share that same sense of grace that was extended to him. And so the first servant paid the price of this lack of compassion and grace as the word got back to the king and the sentence was commenced upon that servant who was unforgiving. Forgiveness and grace work hand in hand and even at times used interchangeably. We know we can't live in this world very long without being hurt. If we are asked how many people listening today had been hurt, I'm sure all of our hands would go up, including mine. We have all been wrong. As a chaplain and a teacher, I can begin to count the times I have heard from people about what, how they have been wounded, mistreated, or victimized. I have sat in many restaurants and coffee shops listening to stories, stories of betrayal, stories of heartbreak that have wrenched my heart. I have had patients and students come into my office and share about things that have happened to them that have broken my heart. You may have joined this worship service today, carrying the weight of a serious wrong that was done to you this past week, this past month, this past year, or years ago. If that's your situation today, and that has been me at many points in my life, the message I am about to share with you this day is going to be hard for you to hear. It involves spiritual surgery. While surgery is never fun, the good news is that God wants to remove that toxicity in our hearts so that we can live lives with love and with joy. That surgery is called forgiveness. Let me tell you what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness does not mean that you instantly stop hurting emotionally. Deep wounds take a long time to heal. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. Now, when you do forgive, you no longer use your memory against, but feel real forgiveness. Real freedom, giving forgiveness, does not mean that you will not forget. Let me say that again. Forgiving does not mean forgetting. When you do forgive, you no longer use that memory against them. But real forgiveness, real freedom giving forgiveness does not mean that you will forget. So what does forgiveness mean? Well, the word that Peter used and Jesus used here in this reading for today means to dismiss, to give up something, to send away or to release something. 
The word that was used in the reading for today was also used to describe Peter and Andrew leaving their nets after Jesus called them to be his disciples in Matthew 4. Then they immediately left their nets and followed him. This word was also used to describe the death of Jesus in Matthew 27. And when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. So to forgive means to release an offense just as Jesus released his spirit. To forgive means to forsake or leave behind an offense just as Peter and Andrew left their nets at the seashore and followed Jesus. They didn't forget their nets or their boats. They just chose to leave them behind. So learn this about forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a choice. And if you have not chosen to release that offense, if you haven't chosen to dismiss it, you have not forgiven them, and you are still in bondage to them. Too often we are like that man who was about to die and express his forgiveness to somebody who had offended him. But then he added, and be now for sure known, if I get well and don't die, the old grudge still holds. The forgiveness that Jesus is talking about means to dismiss it, to leave it behind, to send it away, to release it, to say, how do I know if there is somebody I haven't forgiven? Well, if there is somebody who has offended you, hurt you, abused you, somebody who has wronged you in your childhood or in your college days or have never left them off the hook. So when you think of them, do you think of the wrong that they have done or do you think of the good that is in their hearts? If you think of the wrong that they have done, we have not forgiven them. To this day, when you think of that person and you only think of the offense and you resent them, then you have never forgiven them. And therefore, rather than freedom, you are in bondage to them. Now, if you're going to experience the freedom of forgiving, it begins by coming to grips with that is what Jesus is saying to Peter. To follow him is to forgive like him. In order for us to feel that freedom that comes from forgiveness, we have to come to the grips that it means that if we are going to follow Christ and receive Christ's forgiveness, then we must forgive like him. For a moment, I'm going to speak about grace what a word. In the Christian world, grace is tossed around in thousands of different ways, sometimes referring to God's forgiveness, sometimes it's referring to the abstract theological perspective that is supposed to be the core of what it means to be Christian. Other times, grace refers to something beautiful or skillful, a dancer or a painter may be full of grace. But for me, grace is not an abstract theological concept or an objective or an adjective. It is a way of life. The fact that I am still standing here today, full of faith and hope for the future, well, most of the time anyway, that is grace. The friends and the mentors that God has brought me along in my path who have sojourned with me and offered me guidance in my journeying, that is grace. 
the valuable life lessons that I learned in every church and spiritual community that I have been a part of, that is grace. Grace is a very real, tangible experience that lies at the heart of what forgiveness is and what it means to be reconciled to God and also to be a minister of reconciliation. It's the space that we are given ourselves and others to stumble and to fall without judgment or condemnation. It's the hand we extend to lift up and to help those who have wronged us and they have fallen. Grace is the one thing that can heal all of our wounds, bridge all of our divides, and ultimately save all of our souls. Grace alone. Grace is as hard to live out as it is to experience. It's a radical notion that flips upside down every part of our lives. Grace, when properly understood, calls us out from our comfort and into some of the most painful situations and circumstances for the sake of being healed and redem redemption of our world. Grace isn't about having a second chance. Grace is about having so many chances that you could use them through all of eternity and never come up empty. Forgiveness and grace work hand in hand. And forgiveness starts at home with me. God desires us to give us life, to give us life more abundantly. But often we have things in our lives that are haunting us, that have, well, we have never really let go of. We feel we deserve to carry this burden for the rest of our lives. Yet God wants us to be free from them and to move forward with a fresh and renewedness to our step and ready to put forth our uniqueness, that is us, as we are an important part of making God's dream of earth and heaven into one. Carl Medminger, a psychiatrist, once said that if he could convince the people in psychiatric wards to receive forgiveness and to give perfect forgiveness, 75% would walk out cured in one day. Do you hear that? Do you hear the power of forgiveness? Forgiving self and accepting grace is one of the hardest things for us to do. Forgiving is more about me than it is about the other person. It is releasing the power that the other has over me. If you refuse to forgive, if you refuse to release that offense, you are the one who suffers. Be good to yourself. Let it go. Do yourself a favor and release it. Refusing to forgive will make you a bitter and angry person, an unloving person, or joyless person. When you choose not to forgive, you are the one who suffers. You may not be able to forget, but under God, you can forgive it. Jesus was not a fluffy hippie who just ignored injustices in favor of peace. No, he was actively involved in calling out injustices and speaking truth to the powerful. He called sinners to repentance. He confronted the evil head on. And at the same time, he lifted up the sinners. He offered healing and extended forgiveness to those who despised him. He shared a meal with his so-called friend, who he knew would soon betray him. He spoke with respect to the officials who unjustly tried him. And from the cross, 
the place of supreme injustice, he declared a word of grace to his murderers, to his followers, and to the world. And in that moment, he showed how grace completely destroys the forces of evil and injustice. Grace strips away sin of his power and heals the offender and the offended. In our lives, we are called to extend this kind of grace, radical, unconditional, messy grace. We are called to return to the people and to the places that have done wrong to us and to extend our arms to embrace them. This is the only way healing can begin. This is the one and only way that injustice can be overturned. This is how God has redeemed every one of us, and this is how we must redeem each other. The way of grace and forgiveness is not the easiest path. Life was much simpler before I took my Christian journey seriously. It doesn't make the past go away. It does not make us forget about those who have harmed or injustice put upon us. But what it does do is offer a new and fresh beginning for everyone involved. Amen. Let us now join our voices in song and connecting through music as we prepare ourselves for prayer. Let us join together in prayer. Most gracious and merciful God, we come to you this day. We give thanks for all that we have been given. We are grateful for the opportunities that you have placed before us. And we give you thanks for the way that you speak to us through scripture and prayer. This day we come together and we join with those who struggle with forgiveness, offering, and accepting. Open us to the possibilities of the freedom that comes from living in a life full of grace and forgiveness. Let us be about reconciliation and bringing together and offering each other a space and a place for healing that only forgiveness and grace can offer. We come this day and lift up to you those who are impacted by COVID-19, who have the illness, 
who are caregivers for those who are ill and for all the ways that it has limited and changed our lives. We ask for your help in working through these challenging times and the courage to keep ourselves and others safe. We lift up those with health issues we lift those who have lost a loved one. We remember those with financial struggles and ask that you seek to offer them remedies and a way out of the challenges in which they face. We lift up the unemployed and the underemployed and wrap our arms around them and let them know that God cares and is walking with them. We remember the homeless and the helpless and the lonely this day. And we ask that you allow us to be instruments of your love and your grace and bring about reconciliation into the world in which we live so that we truly are doing our part in bringing about heaven on earth that we pray about each and every Sunday. Let us be a part of the change that needs to happen when we offer and accept forgiveness so that all can flourish and feel the love and the connection that comes from being in community and that we all can experience the desire that you have for each one of us to live life fully and more abundantly. We are the future. We are the ones to make these changes. And so we ask, through song, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we sing. come to the time in our service where we have the opportunity and the privilege to share a part of what God has given to us for the work God has called us to here in this place. God calls us to be a part of that work and to be generous in that which he has given to us. We are called to be about making the change in the world that it needs today, and we are called to give. So we invite you to give and be a part of the change that is happening here in Central Phoenix and be a part of the community we call Central Church. You can too take a part in this and in sharing out of your abundance in the traditional way by mailing a check to the church office or by going to our website and clicking on the button, Give Now. We appreciate your generosity of gifts money, and prayer. We also give a special thanks to all those who continue to give regularly. You, indeed, are our sustaining angels as we go about doing God's work here in this place. As we begin to bring our worship to a close, 
let us join together in our closing song. together in our prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is. Amen. As we close our time together, and I say go in peace, I do not mean go in mindless oblivion. When I say go in peace, I don't mean go without challenging yourself or others. When I say go in peace, I do not mean go in utter ease and comfort. When I say go in peace, I mean go in peace, seeking justice. I mean go in peace, committed to equal rights and equal opportunities for all. When I say go in peace, I mean go in peace that is created when together we build community of true solidarity, deep compassion, and fierce, unrelenting love and radical forgiveness. Let us go in peace. Amen. Thank you.